Our first speaker is Dr. Paul Rogers, and he will be talking about the historical landscape ecology of Sierra Alaska in the western U.S. Paul uh, holds a B.S. and Master's in Geography from Utah State and University of Wisconsin at Madison. His doctorate is from uh, Utah State here in Ecology, which I believe he received last year in 2007. His primary areas of uh, study had been human impacts on vegetation in the western U.S. He, works, uh, he worked for the Forest Service for uh, 16 years, conducting monitoring activities and publishing results uh, from the interior west and in Eastern Europe and East Africa. Paul's research on lichens in Aspen ecosystems has taken him around the region as well as to Umau University in northern Sweden. I think I got that fairly close. He is currently an adjunct assistant professor in the Department of Environment and so uh, Society here at Utah State and is the director of the Western Aspen Alliance, which is housed here in the Department of Wildlife Resources. With that, I'll turn it over to Paul. Good morning. Can you hear me? Great. Um, I just wanted to further extend that invitation. On Thursday afternoon, we're having a meeting of the Western Aspen Alliance. That is an open meeting, so anybody here is welcome to attend, and we'd actually enjoy your input. We're looking to diversify. We want people from various agencies and institutions and any other interest groups. So uh, if you're around on Thursday afternoon, please consider coming to that, and, and we'd love to have you. <clears throat> so my presentation is going to be sort of wide-ranging and, and maybe set the stage for uh, several other more specific talks later, but I'm, I'm focusing on Cyril Aspen here um, in the western U.S. and with a couple of examples in Sierra Nevada and uh, locally here in the Bear River Range. I would like to also emphasize that Cyril Aspen is sort of this year's presentation and we're going to be hitting uh, those stable or persistent Aspen stands with some future work. So uh, keep bear that in mind. Some objectives of this talk, I'm going to focus on this uh, concept of historical range of variability, and I'll define that uh, in a minute here. Uh, past climate and Aspen systems and how those might be tools for the future. So you can see this is going to hopefully tee off the next couple of presentations about future climate. And then uh, a little bit about biodiversity and Aspen dependent species. <clears throat> the roadmap for this talk, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the settings of the, the region and that landscape, uh, the sources that I'm going to be using, and then the sources in the, in the context of historical range of variability. Uh, whoops, human impacts it will be the body of this discussion and some specific examples, as well as some broad trends. Uh, as I said, past climate with a little bit of climate data, and then finally the dependent species, uh, Aspen dependent species. So uh, the setting here, um, on the left is a map of the Sierra Nevada, you're mostly familiar with that. In this case, we used an ecoregion uh, designation there, so a very large area. I'd like to kind of uh, draw your attention to the scale at the bottom there. Uh, uh, in in uh, contrast to the diagram on the right there, which is uh, the surrounding area here. The area I've circled there is the Bear River Range. The star is Logan, Utah, where you're sitting uh, here in the Cache Valley. Uh, <clears throat> the scale, again, almost an order of magnitude difference between these two areas. So again, a region and a landscape that I'll be examining. Uh, the, the circles or the figures within the yellow boundary on the right are the uh, location of the systematic survey that we did in this area looking at Aspen conditions. Just uh, also as a setting here of the forested land cover in California, less than 1% is Aspen. That's primarily in riparian areas. So that's very different, I think, from our intermountain conditions. Uh, in Utah, about 9% of the forest cover is aspen. If you back off and you eliminate the pinyon juniper, which is a large uh, part of this statistic, if you take that away and you look at quote-unquote traditional forest, aspen would be about 15% of the forest cover in this state. And so I will presume that those statistics fit these areas in general that I'm talking about. 
This, this concept of historical range of variability, most of you are familiar with it, but the idea is to examine your local uh, conditions, the uh, landscape of interest, and try to figure out sort of what are, the, what are the general bounds of climate and vegetation and disturbance over a uh, century to millennium kind of a scale. And in that way, you can use that information to help you best design your uh, management approaches. Some of the sources I've used here, uh, systematic field surveys. What I mean by, specifically by that is a uh, statistically defensible uh, means of sampling an area and describing that entire area. That would, this would be in opposition to uh, just going out and putting in survey points or putting in survey points where you see there's some incidence of disease or damage or something. This is a, this is a landscape approach in which when I, when a finished product would be a description of an entire area. Uh, I'll be looking at climate data and in this talk, uh, specifically Palmer Drought Severity Index. Uh, historical records, a whole range of things from agency records, fire records, uh, histories of the area, local uh, descriptions, diaries, all of that type of information, more verbal descriptions. Uh, community ecology, what I mean specifically by that is some sort of multivariate analysis of a particular vegetative community. Could be tree, uh, it could be the tree species, it could be the understory. In my case, I've focused on um, on epiphytic lichens, and I'll, I'll tell you why down the road here a little bit. And then finally, of course, the published literature. That can take me a long ways as far as the items that I could not go out and survey personally or with our team and can, can draw some wider conclusions. Just so you know that, you know, I haven't covered all the bases. There are certainly a number of other techniques that could be employed. I'm not going to be talking about them here, but I believe some of the other speakers will be. Okay, a real uh, general overview of these two areas and the human impacts, the population fluctuations, and I'm talking about human populations. In the Sierra Nevada, in the pre-settlement era, this is prior to roughly 1850, um, moderate populations of Native Americans in their area, somewhere in the area of 100,000 uh, people living in that area prior to European settlement, some kinds of agricultural activities, modest agricultural activities in the area of settlements. Uh, that can be important down the line. Some forest products, root harvesting food, uh, building materials, a little bit of hunting and fishing, and then some native burning. Again, I, um, and, and we can discuss this later, but I believe that those burning impacts are much more acute in and around areas that are settled as opposed to more remote areas in the pre-settlement context. During the settlement period, and this becomes very important for both locations, so you've got a, a moderate to high uh, influx of uh, European uh, settlers in that area, of course, centered originally around the mining boom, but then uh, these other factors coming in too, logging, grazing, and burning as you progress through the later half of the 19th century, and some really high levels of impact. And I'll get into specifics in a minute here. And then in the 20th century, continued uh, uh, high population levels, of course, everybody knows that California is the most populous state, and, and most of that population is outside the Sierra Nevada proper, but a lot of use of that area, development through the uh, 20th century, very large and involved water diversion, uh, damming projects, fire suppression has a big impact on Aspen. What I mean specifically by game management is any manipulations of uh, wildlife populations, for example, elimination of uh, large carnivore, uh, carnivores, that may influence herbivores that, of course, influence uh, uh, aspen reproduction and growth. Roads and development, so still a very high level of impact. Let's contrast that with the Bear River uh, Range. Very low pre-settlement populations. In fact, the uh, Shoshone Indians that live in this area were pretty much transient. And the accounts I've read is very little to no people living in the valley through the year. So annual migrations through this area, certainly use of resources um, to the extent that I don't, that, that it's unclear how much hunting and burning uh, went on. So overall, a pretty low impact. I placed this in here, this European trapping, because this is still within the pre-settlement area. These Europeans were not settling here, but uh, the effects of the trapping, specifically um, American beaver, 
complete uh, or near complete extirpation of that species would certainly have some effect on Aspen. The question is how much. As far as my research takes me, that's mostly within uh, riparian areas between 50 and 100 meters maximum from a riparian area. As I stated earlier, a lot of the aspen in this area is upland. So this is an area I'd like to get into more, but I can't answer that, that uh, impact question right here. So a moderate influx of Europeans starting in 1856, settlement of, uh, of Mormon pioneers in this area. Uh, not a population boom by any means, but a moderate settlement some uh, moderate uh, use of local resources. Uh, the grazing and burning combination is gonna become really crucial in both the Sierra Nevada and the Bear River Range. So, and those impacts are high in some cases, moderate in others. And then still a moderate population uh, in the 20th century, many of the same impacts that were in the Sierra Nevada and then moderate impact levels. Let's get into some of those specifics. Uh, in terms of logging, a very different picture in the Sierra Nevada. And recall that we're not logging Aspen directly, but the, the impact of uh, stripping off large areas of timber is really, it opens up a, a window of opportunity, you might say, for Aspen growth. So it's sort of a secondary situation. Really high levels of, uh, of uh, logging and wood harvest for railroad sheds and for the Comstock mines, for construction of the mines, as well as housing all the people. Flumes to carry wood. Uh, the picture in the lower left there is, uh, it's a little bit faded, but this is around the year 1900. This is Spooner Summit near Lake Tahoe. And you can see that that whole hillside is com almost completely uh, slicked off uh, for various resource uses. On the right, Bear River Range, you had logging for a short period and then uh, moved on to uh, logs and wood materials coming from out of the area because uh, there was railroad transportation coming through this area. Uh, in the late uh, or the early 1870s. So there was only a short period. There was a, there was a, a bit of local logging, but this is, uh, this is areas that are uh, accessible with the, with the equipment uh, and technology of that era. So a uh, very brief time there. Grazing and burning, uh, sheep in the millions in California, California overall. Uh, but the crucial part is that combination, uh, um, grazing in this era, uh, large numbers of sheep out there, but at the, in the fall season when the sheep were brought down the mountain, we lit everything in sight and, uh, <clears throat> and just let it burn. Burn off the whole hillside so that you would get some forage for the following year or the whole mountainside. Uh, similar pattern again in the Bear River Range, not as many, but this is a smaller area, about 300,000 sheep. But some of these quotes in the lower right here are, are really salient to our conversation here. I'll just read the lighter part of that. All the ridges on this side of the Logan River have aspen thickets covering most of their area. This is following uh, a heavy period of burning in the 1880s, 1890s. <clears throat> and that picture of Spooner Summit, today that looks something like this. And you see, as I commented earlier, the riparian uh, association of aspen in the Sierra Nevada. But as soon as you get uphill, you get uh, conifers. So it's an area that would be totally forested it is a point there and after 100 years looks something like that. Let's look a minute at climate here. In the Sierra Nevada, first 50 years of the, the 20th century, the wettest in the last millennium. How does that affect Aspen? Well, indirectly, you have a lack of fire in the past century would have allowed for fur to persist. This has commonly been attributed to fire suppression, and I believe that fire suppression certainly had an effect on the aspen we see today, but climate may have as much or more of an effect, I believe. I'll go to an illustration for the work here. This is a work in progress uh, for the Bear River area. The top graph is uh, the systematic uh, plots that I showed in one of the earlier slides, the map of the Bear River range. And what this is is 47 plots, the number of plots on the y-axis, on the x-axis, uh, you're reading from left to right is years ago, years be, uh, ago from present, so uh, 60, 80, 100, and so on. And this is the years that these stands started out. So you can see that there's a distinct pattern there. About 100 years ago, you get a lot of the aspen coming in that we see on the ground today. 
The crucial part here is you can probably already pick up this, I've chronologically aligned these two graphs. So again, years ago from left to right, and this is Palmer drought uh, severity index. The, the thin blue line across the middle is sort of the neutral amount of moisture. Above that means a moist period, below that a drought period. The dotted lines are annual uh, precipitation values. And the red line is the 20 year rolling average. So I think you can all see there's a high correlation between these two things. When there's drought, there's not much aspen establishment. Uh, drought and fire uh, period followed by an extremely moist period uh, and you've got a lot of aspen establishment in that early 20th century. Uh, you might note, uh, let me see the pointer here, this is our Dust Bowl drought era, 1930s. Again, a little peak after that and again the alignment with aspen establishment. Oh, I also would like to point out and I can give you this later, this is a very valuable resource and this is the literature, this is the website. This information here is uh, Palmer Drought Severity Index is based on 100 years of climate record. Prior to that, it's, cor it's, um, it's tree ring records that's, uh, that's projection uh, moisture. But there's a grid that covers the whole US so you could get this data for your location very easily off the internet. <coughs> Let's put that in the context of the last thousand years. Uh, most people are familiar with the Little Ice Age, approximately three, four hundred year period of cooler and moisture than normal uh, temperatures. Uh, the medieval warm period, a very droughty period. Again, three or four hundred years here. There's a little ice age here, moisture. And let me just add in the 20th century line there. So this again is for uh, the Bear River area. This is the wettest period in the last thousand years, starting off, and we're in the in just past the wettest century in the last thousand years overall. Of course, there's fluctuations in all of these areas. So, again, how does that interact with human impacts in the area, and how does that affect Aspen? That's where this is all going. Okay, the ultimate in uh, Aspen succession. You have a small fir seedling growing up within the live Aspen there. Uh, so at some point, maybe that will overtake it. Some very broad trends here. These are two sort of extremes, you might say. I hope that the further research we do, we're going to find that there's a number of different aspen types, aspen disturbance types. But in terms of reproduction, uh, this is based on a lot of the traditional sources that uh, you are familiar with, but warm, dry uh, conditions favor reoccurring aspen regeneration based on short fire return intervals lighter mixed severity and dominant asexual reproduction. As Johan mentioned earlier in his introduction, we're seeing more and more literature coming out about sexual or reproduction or seedlings coming out. So a different pattern here, you might think of this as maybe sort of a, light, uh, a little ice age scenario. Uh, cool moist conditions favor uh, succession long fire return animals, and I want to emphasize I'm talking about the potential for catastrophic fire and the potential for seedling establishment. Some sources here, quite a number of them out of the Yellowstone area and that seeding event following the Yellowstone fires, uh, but also high elevation in the San Juan Mountains, uh, Elliott and Baker, and then this uh, Utah studies on aspen genetics. Not, we haven't related this to climate. This is Karen Mock's work that was referred to earlier. But within stands large clones around the boundary of large clones, we're finding that there's a lot more sexual reproduction or aspen from seeding than we thought. How common is that? We're still trying to get a handle on it, but probably not as rare as we previously thought. So the take home from this is you know, how do you put all these things in the context of your area and in the context of future climates? So we know a little bit about how Aspen will react. How, how can we take some of this information and make it work for your particular areas? Okay, I want to spend a slide here on Aspen dependent species. Epiphytic lichens, uh, the reason why I chose this is, is twofold. Uh, lichens are a fairly simple ecology. They need some moisture from the air, they need some nutrients from the air, and they need uh, habit, uh, habitat to sit on, essentially a tree, uh, a tree perch. 
they're not really getting any nutrients for the most part from the tree. So it's a, start out with a simple system as the idea and maybe project some of these ideas to understory vegetation or other tree species. This is a model, a hypothetical model of kind of a traditional aspen succession through time. On the lower left there, you have some catastrophic disturbance. Aspen is the grayish shaped line there. Uh, <coughs> This is the Aspen curve over time. You can think of this as about 200 years total, maybe about 80 to 100 years where these cross. Eventually conifers catch up over top that and shade out Aspen. What I'd want to put forward to you is this idea of Aspen dependent species. Those species that need Aspen to survive, they're following the Aspen trend of course and will drop off precipitously, we think, this is my hypothesis, as Aspen does so. I just put in here some of the things that we'll get into a lot more detail with other presentations, but some of those biotic influences. If the lettering's too small there, first at the young age, ungulate browsing, then you have some shading from this period to this period. These bars are kind of the, the periods that they would come into effect. Uh, diseases coming in in aspen stands in this area from 60, 80 years to 120 years having a big impact to start thinning out aspen as they're being overtopped. Uh, and then, of course, when you get enough conifers in there, it carries fire well, and that gives you the ability to p potentially renew the cycle. Or if there's not adequate regeneration, we go off potentially on a different trajectory. A key question that's been hounding us in Aspen uh, ecology for years is, at what point do we lose the viability of this Aspen stand? At what point out here to the right does that go away? So, to test that, Look at this sort of complex diagram. This is, a, um, this is a multivariate analysis of the lichen species and their abundance uh, based on successional classes, one, two, three, four, that you see here, and over again, one, two, three, four. So this is a pure aspen stand. This is an invaded aspen stand, a declining and a remnant. Those are broad classes, successional classes. Uh, what I've used is, uh, uh, statistic called indicator species analysis to test the affinity for any given species for a particular successional stage. Those with the little white circles over them are the statistically significant, um, <coughs> statistically significant indicators. I won't go through the names of these lichens and you may not be familiar with them, but in general uh, the, the take home message here is that some species favor pure aspen stands, some species favor uh, invaded or rem uh, and some species uh, remnant or more old growth stands. The idea being that for biodiversity, species diversity overall, you need sort of a mosaic and you don't want to overmanage for one particular successional stage. So some concluding statements in terms of uh, historical range of variability. Uh, an apt quote from Millar and Wolfenden in the Sierra Nevada area. Restoration using any histor uh, single historical period as a model is probably inappropriate. So that's what I want you to get out of that climate data. If you're modeling your area based on pre-settlement period, which could be likely the Little Ice Age, then maybe that's inappropriate for where our climate's at now or where it's headed. Does that make sense? Simple message for in the climate um, topic, just better understand the past, the better we can manage for the future. And then in terms of detrended species and biodiversity, the old adage from Aldo Leopold, manage by keeping all the parts. That is a mosaic of processes and successional stages. Not so much a focus on composition, what species are out there and where they're at, but trying to get those processes in place that are appropriate to the, to the climate. On the right there, these are some of my favorite friends here, these lichens growing on aspen. Uh, this one in particular is in a pure aspen stand, and these are the Xantho Mendoza species. So, with that, I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators, Ron Ryle, Dale Bartos, Wayne Shepard, David Burton, Leah Schultz, Terry Sherrick, and Roger Rosentreter, and then some of the supporting uh, institutions, and I will take any questions. Yes. I have a question. One of your slides earlier um, stated that, that 100 years ago, warming would have yielded more effective moisture. 
it was a caption. What do you mean by it? That's right. That was from the Sierra Nevada. And I may let one of the crime specialists talk about it a little bit more, but the idea, idea being that with warming in that region, not maybe not in the Bear River area, but in that region, they, they are saying it spawned more moisture to go with that. So they're, they're talking about the 20th century as a whole being a warm, warmer and moister um, uh, climate period. Okay, did the seasonality make a difference in the moisture, or they're just talking about total moisture? I think they're talking about total moisture. And recall, they're talking about a very large region. So there would be some fluctuations within that. And this is, is, is a rough overview of a very large region, especially for the Sierra Nevada discussion. Are there questions or comments? Yeah, in the back. First of all, can you show the slide of PDSI versus... Yeah, can you show the slide of PDSI versus Aspen Establishment? Yes. Can you show that Aspen can be established in a positive phase of PDSI? Yes. And I wonder if you can comment on what you think the mechanism that might be, whether you think PDSI is causing uh, more forest fires there, or is it direct climatically driven mortality, or uh, do you have any other ideas about that? Well, I, I, I should have made that more clear. In that particular case, if you look at that cutoff between the 19th and 20th century, roughly speaking, uh, the moisture following that, the turn of the 20th century is follow, also following on the heels of this large Aspen opportunity of a lot of burning going on. So the mechanism I would uh, conjecture would be um, asexual reproduction from suckering, but there, there could be more seeding going on in there. Is that what you're getting at with that large amount of moisture? And that's really the pattern that they saw in Yellowstone. So a lot of burning, the right soil conditions followed by uh, at least one season of heavy moisture. But I'm seeing it's more of a trend of that. So uh, one would expect to see, as they did in the, in the San Juan mountains at high elevation, some seeding taking place in that very same era with a high amount of moisture going on there. We're not clear exactly what the mechanism is and what's going on there because these papers are just starting to roll out uh, um, showing seeding being more common. Did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah it, it is part of it. And then the other part was whether, it, it's not like you're implying that you believe that the mortality was driven by fire as opposed to direct climatically driven mortality. So you're not, uh, you don't think that there could be widespread past the mortality simply because of drought, is that correct? Um, yeah, the idea, I, I really wasn't talking very much about mortality, and maybe that wasn't clear. I was talking about stand establishment, so regeneration, uh, particularly in the case of Aspen. I didn't really get into detail about mortality in that instance, but I was really talking about Aspen stand starting out. Any other questions, thoughts? Okay. Yeah, would this seem to be coming from uh, post disturbance? Trees or soil things or well, there's there's normally in a, I shouldn't say normally, but often in the Intermountain West in Aspen stands, there's plenty of seed. There's an abundance of seed available. It's the the right conditions for germination that is the key. So, uh, from any mature trees uh, in the area, Aspen seed are very light, so they can carry a long distance. No seed banks with respect to. No, seed banks in the soil. That's from Dale Bardo, so go to the expert. And I'll take one more question. How are we on time here? We've got plenty of time. Oh, we've got plenty of time. Never mind. Roll on. Yes. One more. Yeah. You said that when, when you're talking about the lichens and the other components of aspen stands, that, that they needed diversity. Some were reliant on middle age, some were old age, some were younger age, and you said there's a risk that, that we don't want to overmanage the stands. Would the risk be as great that, that if we didn't do management, that we could undermanage it, that we could undermanage and have the same negative results? I think potentially that's sort of a theoretical question. I'm not sure I want to go there. But I, I, would, I would say that, you know, if you're looking at any given landscape and you survey the aspen that you have out there, 
the first thing to do would be to kind of decide, do we, do we have a, a, some rough amount of each of these success, general successional classes out there in the landscape? If not, what are our options? And that's what you as managers have the expertise to decide. I would, but what I'm cautioning against is some broadcast program where we, where we try to dump everything into one bucket, so to speak, a, a, a risky approach. Is that, is that fair? Yeah. Others? Yes. Uh, succession of like, and is that the result of availability of light? Is that what? Well, it's a combination of light and moisture in terms of, uh, and habitat in terms of uh, like in communities. So it just, I think it's sort of interesting that there's plenty of habitat at a younger age, but it takes sometimes decades for certain species to get established. And it's getting the shading in there, getting the moisture to, to hold those species. But as the, uh, as the aspen tree get older, if you can imagine a stand, there's fewer and fewer aspen, more and more conifers. But those aspen that I, uh, I mentioned in that, that general um, successional trend, the ones that are left tend to be getting more incidences of disease and, and, and more importantly in terms of lichen habitat, more surface area of a given trunk is having more scarring on it. Uh, they, the lichens on aspen are only establishing, for the most part, on the scarred material. So they're not establishing on the smooth bark. Lichens prefer some kind of texture uh, to establish. And I can talk about more about that because that's the topic I get pretty excited about. So if you want to talk about aspen and lichen succession, we can do that afterwards. Okay. Thank you very much.